Good afternoon, I'm Nathan W. Bingham, the Internet Outreach Manager here at Ligonier Ministries. And thank you for joining us for today's live Google Hangout. I am joined by the Executive Director of Truth Exchange and author, and a man who has recently released a teaching series with us here at Ligonier Ministries entitled Only Two Religions. Our guest today is Dr. Peter Jones. Dr. Jones, thank you for joining us. Oh, it's a delight. Uh, I can't have a conversation with you without bringing up the Beatles and John Lennon. Uh, before we dig into the subject matter today, could you tell us a little bit about your interesting relationship with John Lennon? Well, it seems like every book I've written, I've begun off with a mention of John Lennon. So uh, I don't want people to think that I'm looking for reflected glory from my time of friendship with uh, this amazing man. But it happens to be ironic that we both were friends together from the age of 11 to 16 at Quarry Bank High School in Liverpool. And then we went in different directions and actually ended up in a certain sense on totally opposing teams. So I find that to be the most interesting that uh, in the providence of God both John and I have lived through the strange events of the 20th century and my intention in making this video series was really to try to explain to younger folks, millennials in particular, uh, what has happened uh, that has changed their world in such a profound way that wasn't always the case. I'm not saying that the previous world was better in any sense, but that we have gone through some massive changes made by a certain group of people who wanted to bring about changes. And so we mustn't be fooled into thinking that the culture is just neutral. It actually is driven by fundamental ideas. And John Lennon and I found and I find myself uh, on two different positions, uh, really basically contradictory positions. I want to let those uh, that are watching know, because we are talking about your series, as you said, only two religions, but before we uh, begin looking at some of the subject matter, I want to let them know that if they'd like to pick up a copy of your series on DVD, uh, we do have a limited time special. Uh, for the next week until next Tuesday, October the 7th. Uh, they can use the coupon code JONES50, that's J-O-N-E-S-5-0, JONES50, uh, at Ligonier.org in our Ligonier store, and they can get 50% off uh, our already discounted price on this particular series. And if you pick up the DVD, uh, we give you free access to the digital edition as well. Uh, there's a link to be able to get this product in Ligonier's blog post, if you're watching via YouTube, there'll be a link in the description. Or simply go to ligonier.org and search in the search bar there for only two religions. And I'll remind uh, those watching later on in the series about that coupon code uh, if you missed it. Uh, but Dr. Jones, the premise of this series, uh, as people can probably tell from the title, is uh, that you state there are only two religions and you talk of oneism and twoism. Could you just briefly try and explain and define those terms for us? Well, they are simple terms. I'm not inventing fundamental distinctions myself. I just simply came up with two simple terms to describe what is true about reality, and that is that you either have a world that creates itself and has no reality outside of it. It's always been and it always will be, and it uh, therefore uh, is made up of essentially the same stuff. And uh, you can say in spiritual terms, if you are a spiritual oneist, that the world is divine. Nature is divine. Or if you're an atheist, you simply assume that that's all there is. And in a certain sense, at that point, you've given it the same status. So that is oneism. It's a world of basically no distinctions. Distinctions uh, destroy the notion that all is one. And so we see today in our world a massive movement to erase distinctions of all kinds. I like to speak about the busting of the binary. And uh, you and your listeners or viewers certainly see this going on on television 
uh, all day long. And I think it's a very interesting way of getting at what is happening in the present culture. Uh, the other opposite view of things, it really is an opposite view, is that all is two. And I mean by that that the world is not simply uh, a world learned to itself, but actually is the result of the work of an other being, namely the Creator. And his being is very different to the beings that we have as creatures. It's the famous, in Reformed theology, the famous Creator-Creature distinction. And that means that there are two kinds of being in the world of existence, the being of God the Creator, and the being of everything else, which is creature. And it seems to me that those two notions, oneism and twoism, describe essentially the nature of the way things are, and as we are made in to, to worship, these are two religions that can come, especially the oneist religions can come in a thousand different ways, but they're all affirming that fundamental fact that uh, the world is divine, or God is in the world, or whatever, but God is not transcendently separate from the world. So we have basically two religions. So is twoism uh, essentially uh, a unique Christian idea? Well, we all were created with a deep sense of twoism, <laughs> but we suppress that truth and become sinful in suppressing that truth and become oneists. So those who can maintain that notion of twoism uh, really have hung on to the truth about the universe. What would you say um, to those that might try and argue that uh, the God of, or the, the deity of Islam is the same as the God of, of Christianity? Um, how do you address Islam? Is, is Islam a tourist religion as well? On the face of it, it looks like that. And one of the reasons why it does is because it is a Christian heresy. So it's, it's a way of thinking that's grown out of a tourist view of existence. But it has major problems because in its refusal of the basic doctrine of God that Muhammad found in Christianity, it has produced a notion of God where God is called a singularity. God is forever singular. And the problem with that is if God is forever a singularity, then he is impersonal. And so to be personal, God is either a trinity that has always existed in personal relationship, or if you want God to be personal as a singularity, then God has to do something to become personal. In the case of the Quran, God creates human beings in order to have personal relationships. But you see, that makes Allah dependent upon the creation, which is part then of a one system. Or you have the other proposition in Islam, which is Sufism, which is sort of a mystical view of reality, which uh, claims that everything is God. So, I'm God. But see, everything is God means that personhood is involved in that. But that's a purely oneist view of existence. So Islam, while it seems to be truest, inevitably goes towards oneism. We had some people uh, on Facebook, as we were mentioning, we were doing this discussion, asking specifically about Islam. So thank you for, for that particular answer. If we zoom back a little bit and focus more on Western culture, you note in your series that there was a dramatic cultural shift that occurred in the 1960s. Uh, how did that, uh, or how has that uh, affected the culture or influenced the culture in which we live today? I think we are the product of the 60s. Uh, I, when I came back to America uh, from France, godless, secular France, in 1991, I observed what was happening and I noticed Bill Clinton being elected as president and I wrote an article, Hippies in the White House, because I could see that 
something massive was taking place in Western culture that was coming from the 60s. And what were the 60s? But they were a rejection of authority and normative sexuality as we'd known it and normative spirituality. So in those three areas, people were rethinking the notion of God and they were going to the East to find a different view of God, namely a oneist view of God. God is within all things. Uh, they were looking for uh, freedom, liberation from the chains of monogamy and they were looking for liberation in spirituality from a classic Christian view of existence. Now, in my series, in the video series, I tr try to go actually behind the 60s. And I go back to Carl Gustav Jung. And Jung uh, was a psychologist, a Swiss psychologist, who at the early part of the 20th century had a vision of creating a new humanity. And he tried to create a psychological system for the liberation of the subconscious, and in particular, the liberation of the fantasies that we have in the subconscious via what he called archetypes or pagan notions. And so he liberated the human psyche both from monogamy, he had mistresses and so on, as did all his followers, and from biblical spirituality by exposing Western thinking to pagan ideas and I think he succeeded because he was proposing a, psycho a healing psychology and so he healed the West of guilt but of course he destroyed in the West any notion of true right and wrong and what the world really means. So I think I go back to Carl Jung who established in the West this kind of thinking that exploded on the streets in the 60s. What was uh, Jung's idea of bringing healing? You mentioned healing. How did he offer that to people? Well, he felt that uh, psyche, our, our subconscious, was bound by these basically biblical notions of, uh, of the God of the Bible, of sexual monogamy and of spiritual practices. His father, his father was a Lutheran minister who was really quite a liberal and didn't believe what he was preaching. So Jung was looking for a, a more authentic spirituality, which he found actually in Hinduism and Buddhism and many other kinds of spirituality. So that was his goal, to liberate the human psyche or subconscious from the bonds uh, of um, Western thought in order to produce a liberated human being. It, it sounds like from what you mentioned earlier with Paul's word that, words that he was helping people suppress the truth and unrighteousness. <laughs> he did an excellent job. I, I, I single him out simply because this was proposed as the latest um, health bringing psychology and we all jumped on it in the West. How else uh, do we see these pagan and oneist ideas uh, affecting the world today, whether it's in science or law or, or ethics and education? Well, in the video series, I tried to show that there were two phases to this. From the 60s emerged this new spirituality, which was called uh, the New Age. But in recent days, we no longer talk about the New Age, and you have to wonder what happened. Well, actually, the New Age matured and no longer uses the term New Age, it's become now called integral spirituality or progressive spirituality. And what has happened is that the New Age was so focused on the individual and individual experiences of enlightenment that it was criticized for being egotistical. And so in the last 20 or so years, we've seen a focus on the creation of a worldview of pagan thinking, what I like to call a cosmology, which means that it answers all the questions and ex sort of um, produces an expectation 
of how we will all act according to the norms of this new way of thinking. It's not new, of course, but it is new for the West. And so it does. Af it's beginning to affect all these areas, uh, like science. Now this is old evolution, of course, but evolution is rethought now in a oneist sense that um, we are self-generating ourselves, moving forward. There's no notion of God in this view of evolution at all. We are self-creating. In the area of law, we're rejecting natural law. You've noticed that in the way people think today. Certainly we got rid of the Ten Commandments, but uh, even the notion of natural law is now eliminated for pure human convention. And so we have no external authorities in which to establish what is law and of course then we're just turning in on what we think. In education obviously we um, were very suspicious of anything Christian in the schools. Um, any kinds of prayers, uh, football games, that we've seen. But uh, I've been reading about the Common Core which uh, is apparently steeped in progressive ideas imposing some kind of utopian status vision on the next generation. So I think we've, we've not yet seen the impact uh, that Washington statists and administrators want to bring to American education and politics. Without getting too political, I do see a move towards a certain kind of socialism, what I like to call cultural Marxism, and the rejection of the separation of powers. More and more the family, the church, various institutions that are intermediary to the state are being undermined and we're creating a oneist kind of political state. Obviously in sexuality we are rejecting the notion of two genders, uh, of the um, God-given image of male and female and there's a massive pro pro proposing of a, as I said earlier, a, a busting of the binaries of gender. That homosexuality and pansexuality uh, are totally meaningless or that is, the, there are no real sexual distinctions anymore. In ecology, the worship of Gaia is very much a part of this movement. Not everyone does it, but very much a part of this movement is the worship of Gaia. Now, Gaia is nature made into the divine goddess. So that's become a very powerful uh, influence on this cosmology as I'm describing it. In ethics, we've gotten rid of right and wrong, and we're moving to what Carl Jung called the joining of the opposites. That is to say, a human being, to be mature, will take the dark and light side within him and join them together, relativize them, and move forward. And that's a perfectly oneist way of thinking about ethics, that you join what God has separated. So in, in those areas, and we could probably talk about others, I see a massive move in today's world, under the influence, by the way, of this development of a pagan oneist cosmology affecting all areas of life like never before. What about if we consider popular culture? Are there examples uh, in books, uh, movies, TV shows, where we see oneist pagan ideas uh, being pushed to our culture? Do we have any time for that? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, you know, the first one that I saw was George Lucas's Star Wars. I wrote a book series, and my first book was The Gnostic Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> you can see, I was definitely following what he was saying. But that originally came out in 1977. And interestingly, uh, George Lucas was in, deeply influenced by um, Carl Jung. And the dark side and the light side, you remember mm. how in Star Wars you have to balance these two sides. It's really the pagan joining of the opposites. Then you have um, in what date was it? 2009 you have James 
Cameron's avatar. What an incredible presentation of the spirituality of nature and communion with the divine in nature. That was very powerful. I watched the 2014 Grammys uh, in January and I sort of described it to myself as a worship service and it had a beginning, a middle and an end, but anyway uh, there were all kinds of religious statements being made. Katy Perry who was once an evangelical uh, made famous for her song I Kissed a Girl and Liked It she actually presented herself as a witch and uh, she was uh, burned at the stake symbolically this was in her particular part then another one Casey Musgrave who had sung in a church choir uh, she sang a song called follow your arrow and the arrow was aimed at Christianity and her song culminated in the exhortation for people to escape the chains of Christianity. Listen what this song says. So make a lot of noise, kiss lots of boys, or kiss lots of girls if that's something you're into, when the straight and narrow gets a little too straight. Mm -hmm. That's They were the messages coming through. And there were no other spiritual messages coming through, by the way. This was a totally totalitarian uh, emphasis on a particular kind of spirituality and it ends with the um, song of Macklemore and Lewis who were voted voted uh, the best new artists called Same Love. These are homosexuals and their song was to justify homosexuality and the words on this are very interesting. Uh, America the Brave still fears what we don't know and God loves all his children is somehow forgotten. Whatever God you believe in, we come from the same one. Strip away the fears underneath, it's the same love. In other words, all the same love, all the same God. Big message of oneness spirituality. What about in the church today? Do we see oneness ideas influencing oh, yeah. the church broadly speaking? Church broadly speaking, as you know, uh, the mainline churches have bought deeply into this kind of spirituality, even the worship of Gaia. I heard the other day of uh, a church liturgy which was worshiping Mother Earth. I mean, there's no limit to where the church can go. It's, can go. it's certainly adopted this notion of all sexualities are accepted by God as valid and same-sex marriage is something that we should all adopt and this is coming of course into the evangelical churches evangelicals for uh, what's it called Equ equality of marriage I think that's the name uh, they're proposing that we adopt same-sex marriage as a perfectly Christian evangelical thing to do so this and I'm afraid there's a great deal of ignorance finally of how the culture informs the way Christians think. This is why <laughs> I did this series to show the, the, the source of this kind of thinking. It's not coming out of the Bible. It's coming out of a totally pagan revamping of the way 20th century people ought to think from a pagan perspective. Well, I want to remind those that may have just tuned in that we are talking with Dr. Peter Jones. Uh, he has uh, recorded this teaching series at Ligonier Ministries called Only Two Religions. And if you'd like to pick up a copy of this teaching series to hear uh, the, some of the themes that we're touching on today in more detail, you can use the coupon code JONES50, that's J-O-N-E-S-5-0, and visit Ligonier.org and pick up your copy of Only Two Religions for 50% uh, off uh, our already discounted price. And when you grab a copy of the DVD, we give you free access to the digital edition as well. Uh, so follow the link on the blog post or if you're watching via YouTube in the description uh, to pick up your copy. That's Jones50 uh, to get your copy of Only Two Religions. Um, Dr. Jones, how are Christians to respond to our culture today, um, especially as they're calling us 
to state essentially that all beliefs are equal? What, what is the Christian response? I think we've never quite known the massive challenge upon us than we see it today. Because as we see the development of this pagan worldview influencing all areas of existence, Christians can be fooled in one area and they put their hand in that area and then pull through and adopt all the other parts of it too eventually. So I think that Christians need to first of all be aware of what is happening and uh, what I'm teaching and writing hopefully is part of a serious attempt to get people to understand the pagan system. Uh, one is a as opposed to twoism, I, I think we really need to be clear in our minds what the true nature of the struggle is in our time. It's not, it's not people disobeying God's law as such. It's the adoption of a massive pagan way of thinking uh, that cannot be answered by simply saying the Bible says or you're disobedient to God. It has to be an answer from a Christian worldview perspective if we're ever going to make any dent on 21st century people and get them to start thinking about what they are naively assuming is neutral. Um, the Apostle Paul in Romans 12, and I end that DVD series with some references to this text, so I, I think it's important, especially since Paul in Romans has laid out in Romans 1 the pagan worldview. In Romans 12, after developing that and the gospel answer, then in chapter 12 says, um, therefore, and of course when Paul uses the term therefore, you know your ears should open up and uh, he's going to tell you what the implications are. The first thing he says, be not conformed to this world. Your question about how the church is being affected by the culture really is the point of what Paul is saying here, how easy it is to conform our thinking to the world around us. And so many now in our time are doing that. Oh, it was the group Evangelical Evangelicals for Marriage Equality. I just came across that yesterday and thought I would mention it. Evangelicals are assuming the pagan view of saving the planet and they will buy the notion that the gospel is not for saving souls but for saving the planet. Now if we talk about this later I have certain ideas about ecology but this is simply following a pagan view of the planet as Mother Earth. And well, so what, the, what does the Apostle Paul say? He says, do not be transformed, do not be conformed, but be transformed. Have transformed minds. And I believe what Paul means by that is have a radical understanding of the nature of existence as he lays it out in Romans 1. What I would say, we need to have a robust understanding of the truest nature of existence. The second thing he says, God requires holy bodies. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then give your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. And I bring that down to the phrase, God requires holy bodies, and I mean by that intentional, truest, practical living, because holiness is not so much a moral term as it is a cosmological term. Holiness means things in their rightful places, so that the utensils in the temple are holy, not because they're moral, but because they're in the right place at the right time. And I think that's what holiness means for all of us as we find our place in God's beautiful creation. And so we're called upon to be holy in an unholy world of oneism. That's very simple. I do go into detail about that in the video series. 
And uh, so I, I hope that response catches something of what the Christian needs to do in this difficult time. And that is that is helpful. Uh, let's let's touch on a couple of areas uh, you've brought up already, but maybe we can go into a little bit more detail. One of them, I, I would like to to hear more of your thoughts on environmentalism. Um, but before we do that, could you expand on what really is, and you've touched on this, our culture's seeming obsession with homosexuality and homosexual marriage? Uh, just expanding on how that is uh, explicitly related to paganism and this, this oneist idea. Well, it is absolutely connected. I, I believe it is the embodiment of paganism. In other words, you can, you can think thoughts or you act them out. And homosexuality is the embodiment of the pagan notion of the world. Even though we have evangelical Christians denying that and here's why I think so because the Apostle Paul in Romans 1 26 says for this reason now what's verse 25 it's they uh, exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the Creator rather than the create creation rather than the creator. This is the basis, by the way, for everything I say about oneism and twoism. It's Paul who lays this down. We either worship creation or we worship the creator. And then he says, the immediate following phrase, for this reason, and then he de develops with three verses the whole business of homosexuality. In other words, Paul is saying that there is a deep religious spiritual relationship between what you think and how you practice spirituality in a oneist way and how it is worked out in your behavior in particular in sexual behavior I actually came across a statement by a Jungian theorist in 1977 in a book entitled Androgyny towards a new sexuality. She, by the way, said that the age of Aquarius is the age of androgyny. Now, for your listeners, androgyny means the joining of male and female into one human being, the mixing of those two things, the total confusion, if you like, of male and female in one person. And here's what she says. Androgyny is the sacrament of oneism the sacrament. What I'm saying then is what serious thinkers from the other side actually believe that homosexuality is the perfect expression of a oneist world because you see heterosexuality celebrates otherness. Hetero means other. Homo means the same. So homosexuality separates the sameness of everything which is the definition of oneism. So I'm convinced that very subtly but very profoundly our present world by appealing to civil rights and to fair play and tolerance and all those fine sounding words is actually drawing the West into a deep commitment to oneism on all kinds of levels both sexual and spiritual. How so I, I, I do feel <laughs> that making distinctions is absolutely essential. I found this text in Paul. If even lifeless instruments such as the flute or the harp do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? This almost becomes a worldview principle. Unless you make clear distinctions, you can't engage in battle and you can't make music. Well, this is true in our world. I think that we're going towards a, an implosion of our culture by a confusion and an illumination of sexual distinctions. How do we take that understanding? Um, and I know a lot of Christians and even the church is wrestling with these ideas of how do we communicate and relate to people who identifies homosexual, maybe identifies transgendered, um, 
and they wouldn't consciously say that they're being pagan or that they're being influenced by oneist and pagan ideas. How do we take this framework and approach them and mm -hmm. even present the gospel, help, help right. illuminate a, a correct understanding of the world? Well, this is a new and extremely difficult pastoral problem, and I, I, I think that, you know, many are tempted by a, a genuine sense of not wanting to offend, to not speak clearly what Scripture says, or try to twist what Scripture says, for the sake of loving uh, the homosexual individual whom you want to reach with the gospel. But it's interesting that Paul in Romans 1 doesn't hold back in describing homosexuality as against nature and so on, and in other places that you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But he does that because he's so concerned that people like that don't miss eternal life, don't miss hearing the gospel. And the more you cover sin in acceptation of it and downplaying it, people don't hear the gospel in a clear way. That's one thing. But I would say this specifically as we approach uh, homosexuals in our time. We have to propose a cosmology, not moralism. What do I mean by that? I believe we have to make a serious attempt to describe to a homosexual the nature of existence as God has created it, and how that predetermines the way we think about ourselves in two categories, as the image of God in man, male and female does, for instance. But not from a moralistic point of view that you're inferior and we are clearly the most holy people, which is the problem of judgmental moralism and some right-wing churches, alas, have taken that approach. You're the breaker of God's law and all this kind of thing. I think the, the, the approach today is a cosmological reasoning, presenting the way God has created the universe and moving on from there. We need then a caring, God-revealed wisdom, not a holier-than-thou superiority to bring the truth to people like that. Another subject you brought up was environmentalism or the worship of Gaia. Um, our culture does seem to, uh, in a similar way to being obsessed with homosexuality, uh, be obsessed with saving the planet. Um, how, how are Christians to relate to that idea? Can Christians be for uh, protecting the environment? What, what is the connection between paganism and environmentalism? Well. You know, if you worship Mother Earth, you're saving the planet because you believe that that's all there is. And so you can very easily move into a utopian thinking that everything depends upon us and we're going to save the planet and save ourselves, in other words. And, and that, of course, is an error. But that doesn't mean to say that some of those notions are not true. You know, we're fallen creatures and we have to express true things once in a while. In terms of scripture, as you know, we are viceroys under God, as Adam was sent into the world to care for the earth and to limit evil and misuse in our particular time of the fall, and I believe to promote creational blessing. Jesus says, God causes the rain and the sun to fall on unbelievers because it's a beautiful place to be, especially if you live in California, where I do. I feel sorry for you poor people in Florida. Anyway, <laughs> or anywhere else in the USA or the world. But, you know, what is our rallying cry? It is, is, it is not we must save ourselves by saving the planet. It is God is making all things new, and that creation must be respected because it's God's beautiful work, and in it we seek to live as witnesses to who God is, and then that that creation one day will be finally delivered from vanity and from sin and death. 
Now you see, all that we do in the creation is necessarily limited because we don't have the power to free the creation from sin and death. So the gospel is always necessary in our views of, of the way the world is uh, because it's the only thing that actually answers the problem of sin and death. So I think that we must be realistic, uh, faithful in our stewardship of the creation, but refuse the false hopes of utopia and goddess worship, so integral for so many people in this whole thing. Uh, I, I have a friend, Cal Beisner, who works for Cornwall Alliance, and he's often writing these days about helping the poor by opposing the vast spending on the myth of man-made global warming. There's an ecological issue that we need to get involved in because this whole man-made global warming apparently is scientifically suspect and uh, and yet we're pushing this as part of ecology and it may be the possibly the worst thing we can do to help the poor and even help the planet so there's much to be thought through at this level um, what about when it comes to the gospel if if we get tourism wrong do we get the gospel wrong absolutely <laughs> we we fail to um, to understand the gospel if we don't have a tourist uh, context in which to see it. Um, because what is tourism and what is the gospel? The gospel is that the utterly personal other condescends to redeem his creation via the most amazing act any human being can achieve. In other words, we cannot understand God's grace and condescension without a tourist view of who God is and who we are. And that act is so amazing, Paul describes it, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the tourist gospel. Without tourism, there is no gospel. What else does the Christian faith that's distinctly tourist worldview offer to the world? Well, I don't want to give the impression that I'm the only one knowing how to do this. I'm just using these two phrases because they're useful, but so many Christian thinkers, and I think of R.C., my good friend, and all the work he's done. So I don't want to come over as the only person that's seen this, but... Just seeing it from a, a tourist perspective, it makes sense of the world, to see the world in tourist categories. That's all I'm saying. It makes sense of God. He's mysterious but intriguing. He's other than us. He's not the same as us. I always say when I lecture, when I look in the mirror in the morning, if that's God, I'm very disappointed. I'm not going to worship that face in the mirror. <laughs> But if God is the creator who is distinct from us, that's the God I want to worship. So I think in terms of the doctrine of God, the truest understanding of God is so much more demanding and, and satisfying. Obviously, in terms of morals, it makes sense of our innate understanding of right and wrong. We can't get away from that. Even the oneist, he tries to call, say that we should join good and evil and right and wrong but now we're having a terrible problem with the evil of ISIS and some of our politicians are even using the word evil for once but it's very difficult for one us to use that term because they're wanting to bring good and evil and join them into one you see but it doesn't make sense there is genuine evil in the world and we know that right and wrong are part of our very personhood rationality you know, postmodernism says the, there's no truth because we're all self-referential, and so it's foolish to think that there is any truth, except, of course, the truth that they've just spoken in their postmodern conviction. But uh, I believe that God, who is separate from us, who is the Logos, makes sense of our rationality and a universe that makes sense. Of course, the fundamental notion 
of tourism that brings such a profound understanding of existence to us is God who is Trinity, God who is forever personal without depending on creatures to be personal. And so we can believe that personhood is the ultimate expression of who we are and in personhood we have the expression of the notion of love which is also fundamental to existence. You don't get that in Monism. Uh, Dr. Jones, before I give you one final question today, I just want to remind those that are watching live that we are speaking with Dr. Peter Jones, uh, and he has recorded a teaching series uh, at Ligonier Ministries called Only Two Religions. And I do want to let you know that if you'd like to pick up a copy of this DVD, we have a, a special limited offer that uh, is valid until October 7, 2014. You can get this particular DVD uh, from the Ligonier store at ligonier.org and if you use the coupon code JONES50, that's J-O-N-E-S 5-0, we'll give you 50% off our already discounted price. Uh, and when you pick up a, a DVD from the Ligonier store, we always give you access, uh, as long as it's available, to the digital edition as well. Uh, so you'll be able to pick up the DVD and the digital edition uh, at a wonderful discount using the coupon code JONES50. Uh, Dr. Jones, just as we conclude our time uh, together uh, today, this particular interview is quite likely going to be seen by a number of Oneists, non-Christians, uh, as they browse around YouTube and things like that. Uh, what would be your plea to someone who is likely not a self-identified Oneist, but that is their worldview? Mm. Oh, I would just call upon them to seek a transformation of their oneness minds by trying to see reality from God's perspective and hearing the message from that perspective of God's love for sinners, which is the basis of their ultimate significance and human value. We get human rights from God, who is the ultimate creator and distinct person. And from that, we get the sense of everything else. I believe Jesus gave us a tourist theory of everything. I like to call it a cosmic code, a key to existence. He describes a personal universe where all is two. That's the world that we're talking about. It's a cosmology, a personal universe where all is two. And Jesus himself says, we in sort of wrapping up his thinking, we are to love God, the ultimate other, and our neighbors, our immediate other, as we love ourselves, we're our own other, and that the law and the prophets grow out of these two commandments. In other words, everything the scripture has to say has to do with love for the other. And if you have a one system, you see, there is ultimately no place for the other. Paul calls this a profound mystery. The two shall become one flesh. Now, when he says that, he's not talking about the elimination of the two, the, but the maintenance of the two in a reconciled relationship. And he says, the meaning of the universe, the mystery, the great mystery, is the mystery of God in Christ loving the church. Now, we don't become Christ the two are distinct and yet they're joined together as one in a harmony of difference. This is the key to the cosmos, it seems to me, that all is two and we need to relate to God as the other Savior and Redeemer of the world. Well, Dr. Jones, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. We really do appreciate this series. Uh, that you recorded with us, and we pray that the Lord would use it to help uh, educate uh, many in the church and uh, and those in the world to see uh, the truthfulness of a tourist worldview. Well, thank you. I I must say I'm highly honored to have this possibility to work with uh, Ligonier Ministries, for whom I've had such a high opinion for many years, and especially for RC whom I've known for 50 years, actually. So it's uh, a wonderful 
meeting up again. Well, to those that have joined us live, thank you for watching this Google Hangout live. Uh, be sure to follow Ligonier Ministries on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Instagram, and you'll hear about upcoming live events such as today. Uh, and also, don't forget that if you'd like to pick up a copy of Only Two Religions, you can uh, purchase the DVD from the Ligonier store uh, for a limited time until next Tuesday, October 7, uh, at a special discount using the coupon code Jones50. That's J-O-N-E-S-5-0. Uh, well, I'm Nathan W. Bingham, and may you continue to grow in your knowledge of God and His Holiness.